We've got three papers being presented today, um, two of which will be presented by Enrique Del Rey Castillo. He's presenting a paper on behalf of Zibin Lee um, and Kavia Sahami. So I'll just run through Enrique's introduction first. So Enrique is a structural engineer from Spain with over seven years of research experience on seismic behavior and retrofit of existing structures. As a lecturer at the University of Auckland, he's expanded his research interests to include sustainability of concrete, construction management, cost estimation, and automation in construction. Um, he'll be presenting firstly his paper on cost of stronger and stiffer buildings in New Zealand, and also uh, the second paper, testing and recommendations of confinement to wall ends with FRP laminate and spike anchors. So please join me in welcoming Enrique. Um, thank you, John. <clears throat> um, so like uh, John said in my introduction, I'm usually doing research and teaching on seismic behavior of buildings and bridges, concrete mostly, using FRP, using carbon fibers. But um, I initiated this project because um, I thought we should have better buildings that don't suffer damage, and then we don't have a city bogged down in repairs and demolition for 10 years. So this is something that is very close to me personally. Uh, it has been a hard, um, a lot of learning outside of my um, safety net. Uh, this is a four-year project, and I am about 35, 40% into it. So I will be talking mostly about why, the methodology that I developed, and a little bit on the initial results that we are seeing. Uh, I don't want to move forward without thanking EQC. Uh, they have, they are basically the mainly, the only supporter of this project, and they can appreciate the importance of it enough to fund me. Now, how does this work? Yeah. All right, uh, so the motivation why I'm doing this. This is from the 90s, developing in California. Back in the 90s, and even uh, before in the 80s, we still had hundreds thousands of people dying in earthquakes, even in developed countries. So the uh, expectation from society was, I don't want to die in my building. Um, basically, life safety, avoid collapse, right? Now, fast forward 15, 20 years, this is from the uh, Canterbury Earthquake Research uh, Royal Commission, and the expectations have changed. Now, society um, don't want to only uh, survive the earthquake, but arguably they, can, they want to continue their life. They are making dinner, earthquake, oh yes, good, continue making dinner. Now whether we can achieve that is a different story. Um, but I think we can get closer to that. We can get to a state where the building can be repaired easily, quickly, and more important, cheaply. Um, so that was my motivation. Why do we have buildings that suffer so much damage when other buildings don't? And how do we avoid that? Now, there is a lot of research on low damage systems. Uh, Rick was talking about that a lot. Um, dampers, base isolators, many gadgets, like he said. I personally don't think they are going to be widely adopted because of some of the issues he mentioned. Uh, is a specific design. Um, how can we trust them, to what level, rather, can we trust them and implement them in design? I think, in my view, we should just have stronger and stiffer buildings. Stop mucking around with little gadgets, changing different systems in one direction, now walls here, now still there, now a little, no, let's just make regular, normal buildings that we are confident are not going to suffer a lot of damage. We can reduce the drift. Now, when I tell this to some people, they say, what, 0.5% drift, 1% drift? In Chile, they have 0.25% drift. And they build buildings. Um, reduce ductility, two, three, I don't know. I'm not advocating to eliminate the ductile detailing, don't take me wrong, but I think we should reduce ductility because at the end of the day, drift and ductility are related to damage, right? So if we reduce that, we reduce the damage. It's low damage, even if we don't use dampers and all of these fancy systems. Now, when I started this um, journey three years ago, before I even got funding, I was speaking with different friends, colleagues, and 
Many people smarter than me, with much more experience than me, will tell me, well, it's going to be very expensive. And then housing crisis, blah, blah, blah. We cannot get into the market. But many other people, also smarter than me, also with more experience than me, told me, well, actually, that's a perception. The cost is minor. But do we, we don't know. We don't have hard data. We don't know how much it's going to cost for that same building, 10 stories high, 50,000 square meters, whatever, from hazard factor 0.4 to hazard factor 0.6. We don't know that. And that's what I want to do. What is the construction cost of uh, buildings in New Zealand? Now, uh, this is a whole system, right? It's not only the structure. But for now, I'm starting with the structure. So my when I started, I thought, OK, let's collect 20, 25, 30, 50 buildings, study them, redesign them for a higher seismic hazard, and see what the change in cost is. But that proved impossible. People don't want to share how much their building cost. Even councils don't want to share how much their building cost. It was really hard to uh, navigate these issues. And on top of that, each building, like I said before, each building is different. I don't know why we do that in New Zealand. We have uh, brace frames in that direction and walls, concrete walls in that direction. Why? Why do you do that? I don't understand. Maybe because I'm not a practicing engineer. I would love to hear more from practicing engineers. Um, so I had to change my approach, basically. And I decided to create an extensive database. And by extensive, I mean thousands of buildings, 20, 30, 50,000 buildings that we are going to design in quotes. Um, so we can identify the cost drivers, what is driving the cost, and to what extent is more important to have uh, different stru uh, horizontal structures, like diaphragms. It's more important to have different vertical structure. It's more important the reinforcement ratio, the uh, cross-sectional area. Uh, and then if I have a very extensive database, I can apply to a wide range of buildings, because then, I can say in that direction I have frames, in that direction I have walls, if I want to. And then all the predictive tools using machine learning or deep learning require an extensive database. Uh, 500 data points is nothing, require thousands. So how I'm planning to create those buildings, to design those buildings, is using BIM, Revit, to uh, parametrically increase the number of buildings. I'm not going to individually design 20,000 buildings, um, I'm using late-stage estimation techniques. I will get into that in a bit. And I would like to do some uh, detailed structural analysis to see how those buildings are actually performing. For now, I'm only doing preliminary design. So it's basically, oh, sorry. So it's basically combining those three buildings with each building having its specific properties, their seismic capacity, hazard factor 0 0.4, 0 0.6, or 0 0.8, and the cost. Um, this is the program. I don't want to get into too much detail. Um, a lot of students helping me. I'm not alone. Uh, a lot of academics, colleagues, uh, engineers, a lot of people helping me. Um, the first stage at the beginning was, what is this? I had to learn how much I didn't know about the topic. I didn't know anything about um, cost estimation, quantity surveying. Um, then developing the, the methodology that allows me to create so many buildings. Now this year in stage two, stage two and stage three, we are starting to produce those values. So we have, for example, for concrete, 450 uh, concrete frame buildings with their hazard factor attached, um, sized reinforcement ratio, and the cost. Now over the rest of the year, we are going to continue doing that for uh, concrete walls and steel buildings. Hopefully next year we are going to do foundations and related earthworks, which I think is going to be a big effect, and non-structural elements. So now I'm going to give a brief overview of what has been done so far. In the first stage I did, a, or my students, did a literature review of cost estimation. Um, long story short, Early stage cost estimation methods like floor area, $5,000 per square meter, is not accurate. The best accuracy is plus minus 25%, but it's more like minus 50 plus 100%, two times as much. And the final stage cost estimation, which is adding up everything together, 
at least 5% accuracy. So we want to use, that's why I said before, we want to use the early, the final stage cost estimation methods at the early stage of development. Um, another thing my student did is collect, I think, uh, 100 and something papers from overseas on construction cost estimation methods. There is not many research in New Zealand. And he found 70 something uh, parameters, cost drivers that affect the cost, and rank them and give them a score. I have only 50 here. So we know which one is more important, obviously the size of the building, and by how much. So we can see if we put the first five cost drivers together, they account or their influence in the final cost is much higher than anything else. And finally, uh, what tool can we use to predict cost? And basically what this is saying is it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter if we use one machine learning or another or another. What matters is the data. Now we move to try to find whatever research is published in New Zealand because um, we are in a special country, not only because of CIMIC, because also because of the legacy construction methods, and we are a little island in the South Pacific, blah, blah, blah. Um, so we need to uh, relate back to our specific um, environment. Now, this is, a, um, this is a PhD thesis, so it's long and tedious to read. But I think this figure is really good. Um, Basically, this student, Chao, he put together all the parameters that can have an effect on the building development cost, not only construction, and then uh, categorize them in different sectors and put them in this wheel. The closer, which is a bit counterintuitive, but the closer to the center, the more influence they have. So we can see here that at the top, our industry, design, construction, and procurement has the biggest influence on cost. So we need to be careful how we design buildings because we have an influence on cost. Not only structure, all type of uh, design and construction. And then um, this is not peer review um, published data. On the left hand side, this is a graph from the quantity surveyors themselves. And basically they are saying that about 21% of the cost is a structure. Uh, on the right hand side, I have data that Rajesh Dakal from Canterbury sent me from one of his undergraduate projects. And he's basically saying the same thing. Between 20, 22, up to 25, 30% of the cost is a structural. So even in the worst case scenario, that elevating the seismic hazard from 0.4 to 0.6 cost us, let's say, 30% more, a third more, is a third more of 20%. Now, it's not my place to say whether it's worth to require by code a higher seismic demand, but I think my job is to say this is how much it's going to cost. Right, now we go into the methodology of how I'm developing these buildings. I um, start by using Resist, which is a software hosted by NZSE to do preliminary design. There are a lot of limitations in this software. I'm not going to go into detail, but for example, assumes that the diaphragms work perfectly, which we know is not the case. Um, but it's very powerful because it takes me like five minutes to do a preliminary design. It's really quick. Basically, we input the number of floors, the height of the floor, different type of floor systems, live float, blah, 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 facades. Um, then we input where the structure is placed, whether we have concrete walls, frames, or steel. Um, in here we define the seismic hazard, so we can change the soil and the hazard factor. I have one in there, so I can go all the way up to one, which is mm, double. And then in here we can define the lateral system, whether we want concrete walls, concrete frames, steel frames, and then it gives me how close or how far I am from 100% compliant with the, with the code. And then I don't, have, I don't have it in here, but at the bottom I have displacements. So I can see the drift, the displacement and the drift uh, at each level. 
So it's a very powerful tool. Then I can get uh, reports, engineering reports, to know the reinforcement ratio, the size of the structure, and then with all of that information, I go to Revit, I design my building, I am using, I say I, but I actually have an open Revit. It's my students who do it. Um, so they are using Dynamo, which is a plugin for parametric design. Very quickly, we can change the beam type, or in the next slide, oh, the type of floor. So very quickly, we can get the model, the quantity takeoff, how many square meters of floor, how many cubic meters of concrete in beams, in columns. Um, then we use the QV cost builder to uh, match or to add up, rather, all the quantities with all the prices. And finally, we further parameterize the uh, results with MATLAB or Python or Excel. Because, for example, it's not the same to have a lot of small bars for a fixed reinforcement ratio than a fewer bigger bars. The cost is different. So how much, how different is it? And we cannot do that in Revit. Well, actually, we can, but it's more time consuming than doing it here. Right. Um, so now this is this year, 2021. For concrete frames, we are looking at building size, basically area and height, um, type of structure, or rather size of structure, of columns, beams, different reinforcement ratio, different floor types, how much difference is to build precast versus composite versus cast in place, because maybe, and this is my personal opinion, if precast floors don't work and they are more expensive or more or less the same as other type of floors, maybe we shouldn't use precast floors at all. Um, and then different concrete strength, different steel strength. Some preliminary results, take this with a grain of salt. These may not be correct, may change. But basically what we are seeing in this graph is that the cost in Oakland is more expensive, 11% more expensive than Wellington, and 9% more expensive than in Christchurch. This one is interesting. So what I did here is plot for three, five, and 10 stories, two column sizes, the different cost for two hazard factors, 0.13 and 0.5. And the maximum cost, construction cost, is 2.4%. So moving from hazard factor 0.13 to 0.5 is 2.4% more expensive. Now this is not final number because I don't have different foundation system, for example. I don't have different facade system or non-structural elements. So this number may change, but even if it changes by a factor of two, it's 5%. So initial results look promising, but we need to further um, refine these numbers. Now concrete walls, um, same situation, size of the building, um, size of the structure, reinforcement ratio. I would like to look at wall layout because resist cannot do this. Resist can only use one wall, not like corner walls or core walls, T's, L's. Um, I'm not sure how I'm going to do this, but I think it's critical for wall design. And I would also love to see what is the difference between having, maybe this is not showing what I want to say, but what is the difference between having overlapping stirrups or having ties? We know that both work from a um, structural perspective, which one is more expensive, if one of them is more expensive. But um, I'm not sure how I'm going to crack this one. Um, steel structures, size, type of um, structure, like moment resisting frames, braced frames, BRBs, um, different type of floors to see maybe we shouldn't use precast, like I was saying before. Uh, with the steel structures, I'm working with Charles Clifton, who knows much more than I will ever be able to learn, so I'm kind of taking a back step there. And that's it. We have quite a bit of time for questions.
So which one, which type of the building will be the most economic and strongest? What would be the, your ideal building you would go for? Like a com floor and concrete building, or you would go for a steel building and? Um, so first off, it's too early to say. Um, I only have results on concrete frames and only for the structure. Um, I think we have to use both. I don't think we will be able to say don't use steel or it's better to use steel. I think sometimes we use concrete, sometimes we use steel, and that's fine. Um, but I think, yeah, and it's not my place to do to make that decision. I think my job is to get information. So you guys, practicing engineers, developers, architects, owners, uh, regulatory system, can make decisions. It's not only about this is the hazard factor or the seismic hazard. This is how we design buildings to assist that. It's also about how much it's going to cost. In my opinion. Um, we're certainly seeing uh, clients more and more looking at options over and over again. So, I mean, if one aspect of this research is, is a way of, of investigating some of the costs and more of those options um, without necessarily going to be QSX, I suppose it could be quite interesting as well. Yeah. One other thing, I think you've got far too many walls in your buildings here. No one really gets it. Sorry? Too many walls in your buildings. Aren't you just never let you have that many walls? Oh, uh, that's I'm just joking. <laughs> Now, but actually that's a very good point because in Chile, for example, because they have, I'm not from Chile, I'm from Spain, but we speak the same language, so I have a lot of friends from Chile. And when they told me they have a 0.25 drift limit, I was also like, what? Is that even possible? They just don't want damage. Everything remains elastic, so they have to put walls everywhere. So any more questions on, on that paper? This is a very interesting study you're doing, uh, and I guess this is not so much as a question as a comment um, regarding your um, structure, RC shear walls, um, gen wall, CSOC tool, and come along to a session in 20 minutes in uh, 4A, 5A, whatever it is, um, so that can be driven in batch mode. Mm. Um, so it's plain text file, and, and, and you can do data in and data out, uh, as you can do with other CSOC tools. Yeah, sure, yeah. I'm happy to discuss. I'll tell you that. It's a good idea. One more question Yeah, thanks for the presentation. Uh, just a question. Um, when your four year study is finished, how will this get uh, presented to the industry? Because I, I think I've, I've had this kind of notion for a while that it's not that much more expensive. But it seems that. The perception is that it will that, that it is more expensive. So, um, yeah, is it, what, what's the strategy for that? Yeah, very good question. So, it is going to be more expensive because we're using more concrete, more steel. It has to be more expensive. The question is how much more expensive. Um, now, uh, I'm working with a lot of um, organizations, uh, EQC, Engineering New Zealand. So I think uh, dissemination is not going to be a huge issue. Um, I'm also part of CSOC, so I don't think it's going to be a big issue to organize um, seminars outside of the normal conferences and publications. Um, I think, but on top of that, I think maybe the most powerful outcome is the uh, predictive tool that I'm trying to, to produce. Now, I'm not, sure if, I'm not sure if this will work or how it will work, but my plan is to have a software that you just input, this is my building, similar to this, this is my building, floor, height, um, I want to use concrete frames uh, of this size with this reinforcement ratio, this is the cost. And if you change that reinforcement ratio, for example, from 3 to 4 or to 2 or whatever, it updates the price, the cost automatically. That's my vision. I haven't had time to think about that too hard yet because I have all the more immediate things, but that's where I think this is going. Well, good. Okay, thanks very much, Enrico. We'll let you um, check off whenever you're ready with um, the second paper. Yeah, thank you. Um, so I'm presenting this on behalf of my student who couldn't come. 
Xi Bin or Victor Lee. Um, this is more right down my alley. This is what I've been working on the last seven and a half years, using carbon fiber to strengthen walls. Um, uh, my colleague Rick Henry is helping me on this, and Andy from Homs, to try to keep us in the right track of doing things that are useful for industry. Um, this is a also a work in progress. The student is supposed to finish in about a year, so the results are not final. Now, uh, the problem that we are trying to solve is um, similar reinforced walls, mainly from the before uh, 82, sometimes also from the 80s, but mainly before 82. And the problem is because they are similar reinforced, um, there is no uh, confinement, obviously. So we have axial failure and out of plane failure, quite brittle failure. So that's what we are trying to solve by confining the end regions. This is the wall that were tested by another PhD student a few years ago. This is just an example. He tested a few walls. We can see that at 0.75% drift, the um, concrete is starting to crack and fall heavily. The um, load is kind of at the peak. From 1% drift, all of that chunk of concrete is gone, and the load starts to drop. And at 1.5 and 2%, basically there is no building, it's on the floor. So that's what we are trying to solve increase that ductility, that uh, lateral displacement capacity. <clears throat> we are using FRP. Um, hopefully, most of you know what FRP is. It's uh, carbon fibers, very lightweight, they were nothing. Um, they have high strength, they are mostly unidirectional material. Uh, you um, soak the fibers in epoxy, it's like a glue, and then uh, bond it to the external surface of the structural element. Uh, it doesn't corrode, it doesn't rust, um, it doesn't occupy space, so if we are talking about a wall, for example, you could enlarge the ends, but that is going to, the owner of the building is not going to be very happy because it's losing real estate. <coughs> Um, here we have, on the right is just a video of the wall, what it looks like once repaired. The guys at BBR Contact did the uh, reparation. Uh, on the left hand side we have, on green, the wall from a few years ago. So at 0 0.75, 1% drift, the load drops and there is no wall anymore. And now the strength and wall, this, is, this was tested on Thursday, so it's very fast. Uh, the load kept increasing just a tiny little bit, up to 2% drift. And even after 2% drift, the load only dropped about 30 to 40%. Up to 4.5% drift, where we have rigid body rotation working. <coughs> and we thought, what are we doing here? Why are we still doing this? Because we're going to keep going. Um, so very exciting. Maybe not for you, but for me it's very exciting to have this kind of results and show that it works. I was not confident that it was going to work. Um, because there is no research on this, but it's working well. Now this is the idea, right? To uh, confine the, the end regions of the wall. If we have the wall like this, the ends are taking compression and tension, right? If we have uh, two layers of steel, well confined, even if the concrete is false, the concrete is confined inside, inside the core, it's not going to um, lose a lot of um, load carrying capacity. But if there is only one layer, we need to add that confinement. If we have only the use like this of FRP on the edge of the wall, when we have high compression loads, which result in expansion, the use will open like this. So we need to drill through the wall and tie the two ends of the U with what is called FRP anchor. These are just bundles of fibers. Instead of being sheets, they are uh, like a rope that you pass through the hole and open to both sides. Like, let me go back and forth. It's not very visible here. Ah, there you go. They open like this. So that's the end region. We're also testing this in case the wall, we cannot wrap around the wall because we have a non-structural element, like a retaining wall or whatever obstruction we can have. So we are testing both cases. 
Um, so Victor, my student, did a whole bunch of prisms. I don't know how many, 70, 80, I don't know. Uh, he tested two different um, aspect ratios. So the thickness versus the length of the end region, square and rectangular. Um, he tested different um, spacing between the anchors, um, different anchor size. <clears throat> this is how uh, he did the test, a uh, compression machine here on the left, recording the load, recording the displacement, and then we use digital image correlation, or DIC, which basically captures the pictures as the prism is compressed, and uh, through a computer <laughs> software, we can see how the pixels move and translate that into displacement and strain. So we can get the strains of the whole area there and see where the stress concentrates and why and how and when um, things break. Um, we have two main failure modes, concrete spoiling if the space is too large, and fiber rupture is the, if the space is small enough that the concrete cannot spoil and the fibers break. Here we have uh, the exact same prism, well obviously not the same prism, but the same properties. We can see that we have FRP, 30 MPa, and then very brittle, it fails. With FRP at, and anchors at spacing of 90 millimeters, it keeps going. It just keeps going. Very dark tight, all the way up to 0 0.1, 0 0.01 strain. So it works on a prism. How is it going to work in a wall? That's what we are testing now. So uh, in here we have the effect of anchor spacing. We can see a huge difference in when the spacing is 180 millimeters. I mean, it's better, of course it's better, but in terms of activity, not much better. The strain or the stress is better, the strain not so much. When we get close anchors, look at the strain. It goes all the way to 0 0.01, 0 0.03. So, long story short, the spacing is critical. Now, uh, the effect of anchor size. So we have um, 14 square millimeters, the cross-sectional area of the double in here, and 28 in here. And we can see that there is quite a difference in the strain. Not so much as with the spacing there. And then with the cross-sectional, so we have, on the right hand side we have a square, S, and rectangular on the left R. And we can see that square um, confinement works better. We know that already. But um, I think it's good to know how that is, uh, or how much you can extend that aspect ratio. So the final idea is to give some sort of design guidelines, design recommendation, a uh, step by step process on how to do this. Uh, we are still testing walls. So I will not be able to give you some final recommendations, they may change. But for now, as a kind of rule of thumb, we should keep always the cross-sectional aspect ratio of less than 1.5. So if the thickness of the wall is 200, 1.5 times that, 300 maximum. If we need to confine more than 300, then we need two confinement areas. Um, anchor spacing always smaller than the thickness of the wall and then depending on the aspect ratio if the aspect ratio is between 1 and 1.33 then the spacing is less than 120 if the aspect ratio is between 1.33 and 1.5 then the spacing is 90 millimeters and then cross-sectional uh, area if the spacing is less than 90 then the area is 28 square millimeters this is dry fibers, not cured and if the spacing is more than 90, then the area is 56. Now these numbers may sound a bit odd, like why not 25 or 30? This is because we're using Sika products and they come at 28 mm square millimeter uh, bundles. And again, as a disclaimer in here, these are provisional. They may change as we do more testing, as we analyze the results, and especially as we test the walls. But um, I just wanted to uh, finish the presentation with this video because I think it shows very well the huge improvement. I'm not trying to sell anything here, I'm just excited 
of the performance of the wall. Bar fractures there, the load drops about 30%, and then it's a rocking system. And that's all. Um, thank you to all the people that have helped, especially QC, Contec, and Sika, providing the materials and doing the installation. Thank you. Probably got plenty of time for questions. Um, if anyone wants to um, have first crack, I had a meeting question. Um, you had a few dimensional um, recommendations there, preliminary. Um, did you have a length of confinement uh, up the wall, height of confinement? Uh, that is going to be determined by ACI 440. Right. And so for, for is that based on the thickness of the wall, uh, length of the wall? What yes. Is, yep. Right. All right, thanks, and thanks again, Enrique. Thank you. Cheers. Uh, the next uh, speaker is Kaveh Sahami. Kaveh is the technical director at Tectonis Group. He's an accomplished professional structural engineer with a de demonstrated history of working in the industry. He's been leading or contributing to a number of prominent projects, equipping dissipation energy devices as an efficient seismic solution to protect residential, commercial, and industrial structures. And he will be presenting his paper on innovative low damage uh, anchorage systems for tanks and vessels. So uh, before moving forward, just a little, uh, just to give a little background of uh, how we initiate and we uh, engage in this project. Following the earthquake, two major earthquake happened in South Thailand. Uh, 2013 and 2016 Kaikoura, which was quite uh, uh, close to the Marlboro region, which uh, probably you better know than me, the center of the wine industry here in New Zealand. More than 70% of the uh, New Zealand wine are produced in this region, and you know that there was quite a significant heat for the wineries. There was a range of failure in the uh, in the in their assets, especially in their tanks. So. That raised a lot of questions. Uh, there was a lot of argument uh, between engineer, the client, and of course insurance. So there was, uh, in 2016, according to the insurance report, was more than uh, $250 million uh, loss. So that was a lot of argument there. So uh, insurance uh, put pressure to improve the performance by uh, encouraging the engineer to, re to increase the uh, importance factor and also engineers start to thinking we are following the code, we are uh, going through the step has been suggested in the code, but maybe it's not good enough to satisfy the uh, expectation of the client. So that was the point in 2016, 2018, we have been approached by one of the tank manufacturer uh, here in Hamilton. They were looking for a solution to uh, improve the integrity of this type of a structure. So at that stage, honestly, uh, you know, uh, we, we, we haven't had that much experience on this type of a structure. So we are start thinking uh, and uh, assessing what is the problem, what is the current situation, and, and which part we can uh, contribute to improve the performance of the connection of this tank. So this type of a structure, uh, as you know, are connected and kind of tied down to the ground with a limit number of the, uh, the anchor bolts or hold down system. And the performance and, the, and the, the seismic performance of this system is quite dependent on the performance of this, uh, this connection. The ductility and damping are supposed to come from this connection. So that, that's quite a critical factor in terms of the uh, integrity of the whole. Uh, the, the whole superstructure. So uh, just to have a bit of introduction of what is the common practice for this uh, type of uh, uh, structure. So you can see uh, on this, this uh, photo. So this is the, one of the most common type of the anchor bolt. They include the neck uh, rod system, which are responsible to take the shear force as well as the tension. 
So there are many more connections. This one are recognized as a Taylor connection. They uh, kind of uh, isolate the bolt to just be responsible for taking the tension and the shear would uh, be transferred to the shear key at the bottom to which has been anchored to the, uh, uh, to the foundation. Recently, uh, many new connections have been proposed. This one uh, are recognized as the buckling restraint system, which I will discuss about the uh, concept more in, in the further slide. But in terms of the performance of the connection, uh, this type of connection can take more number of cycles during a seismic event. Uh, many more connections you can find if you go to the wineries. Uh, that would be a surprise for, uh, for, for you. That Even in one winery, you can four or five type of the anchor board, and all are designing with the same ductility factor. So for example, this one, uh, which has been uh, called Merisco, probably the first, first time has been used in the Merisco winery. So uh, apparently, the main feature they were looking for was the look of this, uh, this connection. So as you can see, there wouldn't be anything outside. The, the, the rod would be bolted from inside to the skirt, and that space would be filled uh, with the concrete. Uh, so after the earthquake, they notice there is no way they can assess uh, how how is the situation around this yard because it was buried uh, with the fund, with the with the concrete. So basically, they are quite blind what is happening inside. Uh, this this type you can you see a cylinder, but has been filled with the number of disc springs to get uh, a linear performance, but with. Uh, can take more number of cycles. This is the detail below, belong to the uh, pressure vessel. This type of tank, uh, in terms of the manufacturing, are uh, a bit more expensive. So the intention was to make the connection rigid to have a higher protection of this type of tank. Also, you, you will find uh, a small or mid side of the tank, which are uh, actually, basically, they are unanchored. They, rely on the weights uh, to bring back the tank in, during the seismic event. So if you want to categorize, there would be an anchor tank, which uh, in ter conceptually, in terms of the seismic demand, would be OK. That would be uh, the minimum seismic force transmitted. But in terms of the displacement, it's not that much reliable. So the fully anchored system has been emerged. Uh, in terms of the displacement control, they are much better. But the problem is the, uh, the rate of seismic force uh, would be at the highest level. So ductile system is under uh, more attention. So uh, because that would be something in between to control displacement to be within the limits and also uh, uh, reduce the seismic demand. So to just uh, have a, a bit of sense of what happened in uh, that earthquake, I borrowed some material from a published paper, which they investigate around 11 wineries in that region with a good number of tanks. And according to this report, uh, average 70% of the total damping, uh, total uh, tank in, that, uh, in those wineries at least have uh, one sort of damage. And if we go through the details, uh, you, you will see the most common type of failure belong to the anchor bolt. So following that uh, event, uh, so many more uh, type of connection has been proposed. And if you look at the number in 2016, the, the failure of the anchor drop uh, almost by half, which means per, per, the anchor system per se perform much better. But if we go uh, and check the, the damage rate for the tank, uh, the barrel, and the roof, we, we will find that the number increases almost double, which means uh, though this, the uh, anchor system performed better, but the force has been transferred to the other part, uh, to the superstructure, and which is, uh, is, is not desirable design because retrofitting of the tank is not as easy as replacing of the anchor board. So, uh, so as... Uh, uh, discuss that neck rod system is the most common type uh, which uh, has been designed to bring the ductility. So at the design level, we expect to have to see yielding and some sort of damage. And this performance uh, in the next cycle gradually drops. So there would be kind of degradation of this system. So uh, what uh, the failure mode uh, actually of this type of damage was the rupture, shearing off, and also buckling uh, of the rod, which happened uh, during uh, those both events. So the buckling restraint system has been proposed to address this issue uh, 
to kind of, this is the similar concept to BRB by covering that next portion, uh, the buckling mode has been controlled. And as you can see that you can get much more number of cycle uh, with a repeated, uh, the, the, the performance could be, uh, it, it, actually that degradation has been solved in this uh, concept. But the point that should be noticed during the design is, uh, so there would be a resisting force on the reverse cycle. So when the tank want to came back to initial position, as uh, the, the tank need to overcome the compression, uh, uh, compression coming from the hold on, there would be a local compression zone. So the tank should be designed to overcome this, uh, to overcome this uh, amount of damping because the buckling is the uh, weakness of the tank barrel. As you can see, the, uh, the most common type of uh, failure mode is the buckling, which normally happens at the bottom or mid heights. In the worst case scenario, uh, you know, uh, the collapsing or colliding the adjacent tank uh, can happen, which would be uh, basically which would be the case for the tank which are on anchor or the resistance system is not enough to cope with the seismic force. So uh, that was the starting point for us to think what would be the ideal system to, uh, to, to, be, in, uh, to be attached to the tank to uh, have a better integrity in terms of the per seismic performance. So we were looking for a tension-only system to avoid having that uh, local compression zone. Also uh, come up with the solution that can take more number of cycles without sacrificing of the performance. So we consider a combination of the friction and a spring action. So the friction would be responsible to uh, dissipate energy and also the spring action can take it back and make it uh, self-centering or tension only concept. So if you combine these two actions, you get, you get the uh, hysteresis loop, which is uh, uh, recognized as a, a flagship concept. Here you can see the first prototype uh, we tested at AUT. Uh, this was a very compact version, 40 kilonewton capacity. And this is the, uh, actually one of the prototypes we tested for a real project. Uh, personally, what uh, I like about this testable concept is that you can uh, see the, perf the performance that you have considered design level. That's, give you a bit of more confidence uh, that you, you, you are not sacrificing the performance. You, you are eliminating at least one parameter that, uh, which is the performance of the hold on system. So uh, as you can see, the detail design has changed. That was the feedback we got from the, uh, uh, the, the engineer, uh, the actually tank, in, uh, tank designer engineer. So we added a weld block at the back to be able to directly be uh, welded to the uh, side of the tank. So that make it more straightforward in terms of the uh, installation. So uh, that was the first stage to develop a concept. So the next stage was to have a comparative study to see what, what is the benefit or what is the disadvantage of this solution in comparison to the other uh, available uh, the, or the common practice uh, solution in the market. So we considered we consider three concepts, uh, neck rod, anchor system, buckling restream, and uh, of course the, uh, this concept, this, which we call it RSFD, which is the tension only friction damper. So we follow the procedure has been described in the, uh, in the code. I don't go to the details. You can find more details on the paper. So uh, according to the Newsland design guard for the tank design, the effect of ductility and damping in the base shear and overturning movement uh, would be replicated by uh, KF factor parameter, which include the, uh, the effect of these two. So that actually would be the parameter that we need to assess uh, to have a comparison between these concepts. So we conduct a pilot study uh, uh, around 150K tank. Uh, we assume to be uh, uh, with the design law for 50 years, aisle two. So, and you, you, we extract the uh, behavior of the, uh, these three concepts. You can, here you can see the pull-push response uh, of the joint and the scale of the joint and also the, the, the tank, uh, the whole system, the tank with the uh, connection. 
And what's basically what we did, uh, we did a primary design and then we uh, shake it by a good number of uh, time uh, uh, records to evaluate the seismic performance on the uh, on the real, on the, considering the real situation. So in this uh, slide, uh, the, res the result uh, pretty much has been uh, summarized. And there we actually, the K factor based shear and displacement of the, uh, and also the damping ratio of these uh, three concepts has been compared. So actually, at the first stage, what uh, we were looking for was to have a, a system at least can provide the same ductility and damping to the other system. But what we learn uh, from this concept, and we actually uh, we did a lot of analysis in terms of the tuning of this joint. And as you can see in this graph, the, the scale factor of uh, one that replicate the, the design level, we consider a wider range of scale factor, which uh, is considered for weaker or stronger uh, uh, ground motion. But uh, what we learn that this tune, uh, tunability of the joint uh, make it possible that the joint active, active, be activated early, at earlier stage, so which could be a positive point, because the, in terms of the uh, you know, damping ratio and the ductility, having lower slip point compared to the other system, since the system is not uh, supposed to be damaged or having uh, a failure du during the design level, that's uh, make it possible to play with the sleeping point. So that feature helped us to, uh, to get a, 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 a even better uh, performance in terms of the uh, reduction factor. In this case, that was around 30% less than the uh, other two concepts. Also, we have two uh, control points, which is the SLS level. So the sleep point always should be higher than level to satisfy the SLS level and also uh, the displacement de uh, demands. So displacement demand depends on the industry could be different. Uh, the winery could be different from, def definitely different from the petrochemical. The standard, uh, the distance between the tank is different. So that would be another uh, limit point for us to make sure uh, that uh, playing with that, uh, the, 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 the specs of the whole down can satisfy these two factors. <clears throat> So that, you know, the result uh, we got from that uh, case study also was the case, the similar result we get for the real projects. So uh, minimum 30% uh, we expect to, uh, can, we, we can save on the uh, seismic uh, force which is transmitted to the tank wall and also the foundation. So just uh, to have a bit of uh, uh, explanation what what procedure we went through. So actually we were quite uh, new in this concept. So that the, this new system required to be uh, reviewed at different stage. So the first uh, actually a step was, uh, you know, after testing, after developing, and after getting the uh, result, we discussed this with the uh, experts and the practicing engineer, at the, they were they were uh, designing the tank. So there was a lot of back and forth, obviously. So we uh, changed details to satisfy the demands to meet the requirement. At another level, we uh, uh, actually uh, the, the seismic performance of device and the seismic performance of the tank uh, with this concept has been peer reviewed by uh, an independent peer, uh, CIP engineer to, to confirm the rate of that uh, reduction factor and also damping we got from this concept. And the, on the top of that, the, the whole package, not only the seismic performance, uh, all other aspects in terms of interaction with the foundation, displacement, uh, the other equipment are attached to the tank has been reviewed by another uh, party, which they 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 uh, they had a mechanical and structural engineer, and after finalizing, after having all those minds uh, on the table, we finalized the design, and the output uh, have been passed to uh, be used for designing the foundation. So, uh, yesterday there was a lot of discussion about the. Uh, the mistake can happen, so what is, uh, so how we can judge the result. So this also was a big concern for us, so we are not pushing uh, to get the, the, the performance to be at the 
uh, to, to be very close to the limit. So normally for the uh, real project, what we do, what we got from the hand calculation, following the code, pushover, time, linear time, so everything. So we normally consider at least 20% uh, to be uh, there as a safety margin. On the top of that, normally we design the joint uh, to have at least 50% extra displacement capacity to make sure even for the stronger uh, or unexpected seismic motion, which we all know that there's, there is a chance always uh, happen. So we still stand at the far from the, 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 from the limit. So even after that, if reaching to that level, so uh, still there would be a rot which uh, bring us uh, uh, res some reserve capacity to make sure we are not reaching to, to the breaking point, to the breaking point of the whole. <coughs> so this is the, uh, one of the projects uh, we delivered last year uh, that belonged, uh, so that was uh, for the Yeland uh, wineries, 175 uh, kilolit tank, and also the second project, which uh, totally was more than 20 tanks, was belonging to the NZ wine, 125. And now we have been engaged uh, with the other industry, dairy, uh, silo, and also some tower pressure tank uh, coming from the petrochemical industry. And hopefully uh, next year we have more story to tell about this concept. Yeah. This is it. Let's go in. Is uh, any questions on, on that? Talk. Um, I, I had one at least. Um, your, your tanks, they were replacement tanks, were they after the um, after earthquake damage? The ones, that, the projects that you guys did. Uh, so regarding that damage tanks. Oh, just just the ones you had in the, in the final slide there. So so basically, so that you know, they they, they uh, there are two different approaches. So some of these tanks required to they replace the uh, the body. And also, they, they are thinking to not using the full capacity of this time. So, so because in some of uh, you know the cases that we uh, actually when we did a lot of these big time are uh, using in house, so there is no way they can take it out and bring it back. So we have actually we have been engaged in some of these projects. So basically, what we propose to instead of uh, you know strength instead of the uh, replacing or not using the full capacity, we, we, we are able to reduce the demand. But at that portion, they still need to uh, replace that, that, that the bulk yeah. 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 Any other questions? Um, the only other thing was, just wanted to go back to the device, you explained a view of the device and just explain a little bit more about how the, how the device actually works, because yeah. I think you, you yeah. said yeah. it's a mixture of friction and, yeah, yeah. and yeah. sprint, yeah. I don't quite follow that. It's obviously quite different from the setup to your, your other devices. So, at the top portion, uh, there is a shaft which, uh, and the, the outer cylinder through some clamping wall would be. Uh, to be clamped to the, to the inner shaft that's bring the, the actually the uh, friction and this is quite similar. So depending on the rate of the friction force that we are looking for, we can stress that force which provides the, the friction uh, part. And then the, there is a stack of this uh, in the, the shaft which is pushed. So this uh, this spring needs to be pre-stressed enough. To when they, they reach to the maximum deflection, is able to bring back the shaft because there is a friction there. So the, the pre-stressing of this this spring should be good enough, should be enough to uh, provide enough force to bring it to pull back the the, uh, the shaft, which is under uh, under friction with the other So is it quite sensitive to how tightly you got the um, those those bolts that, that bring those two uh, two halves together? So, uh, the clampable? Yeah, the clampable. Yeah, yeah, so that we, we tune that. So, we tune, so the, uh, for each product, we need to tune that to get the right clamping force for each ball to get the, exactly what we require to, uh, 
nothing else. I think we'll, um, we'll wrap up the session and um, thanks everyone for coming along and we'll just uh, express our thanks again for, um, for uh, the talks.